Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual Meet the Artist Talk with Sarah Schneckloff. My name is Jackie Adams, Director of Art and Learning at the Columbia Museum of Art, and it's my pleasure to host today's talk with Sarah, whose work is currently on display in the Ginyard Gallery through January 10th in a solo show entitled Island Nations, Lands Divided. This show explores through drawing how science, imagination, and the body inform one another, combining those really beautiful visual languages of biology and geology into these all immersive encompassing, encompassing mixed media drawings. So I've had the pleasure of getting to know Sarah and her work through putting this show together. And I'm truly delighted that we get to spend some time together with you to share and inspire others uh, through her creative process and her adventures, which she is gonna share all with you in just a few moments. In addition to being a practicing and exhibiting local global and ground trekking artist, Sarah has spent the last 13 years residing in both Regina, New Mexico and Columbia, South Carolina, where we are lucky to have her as an associate professor with the School of Visual Art and design at the University of South Carolina. So again, welcome everyone to today's talk. Settle in, get ready for a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of adventure through Sarah's work. And with that, I would like to welcome Sarah Schneckloff. Hello and greetings. And um, the, the admiration is completely reciprocal, Jackie. And I just wanna thank you and the people behind the scenes too, putting this together. Thank you to Wilson, thank you to Drew, um, and really for everyone at the CMA for making this such a fantastic experience and to be able to put work up in a way that can be um, both local and, and far reaching at the same time. And to be able to be online with everyone today um, too. So I am delighted to be here. And um, Jackie, I really appreciate too that you, you are putting things regularly in the context of adventure, because I feel like it's been a, a year of, of adventure and misadventure um, in, in so many ways. And hopefully this is just a way to get a glimpse into um, just a, a, a place apart for a while. Um, and today I'm talking about two different projects. Um, one, the, the drawings that are up currently at the CMA and where those originated, how those evolved. And then another project that came right before that dealing with um, seeds, biodiversity, and um, the, human, the human hand and human influence. And um, before we go anywhere, though, I'd like to um, just briefly take us um, into the Badlands and just get a glimpse of um, this, this terrain that I've been lucky enough to call call partial home for the last couple of years. And um, what we're looking at now is a flyover of an area in the northwest corner of New Mexico called the San Juan Basin Badlands. And part of what I've just perpetually been so inspired by and attracted to about this terrain is it's a confrontation with the raw elements. It is a scale that's both staggering um, and also intimate. You feel like you can enter into it. Um, you can imagine your, yourself moving through this environment and it lends itself so readily to this slippage through, through time. So things that I think are, are these weighty concerns just tend to fall away in some ways um, when being in this environment. So the act of drawing for me is a way to both translate and to be in the space that I find myself within to look at things that are held in hand um, to get above a landscape and, and imagine myself in it and more than anything too to feel what that sensory experience is um, of being being in something that is both so foreign and so familiar at the same time. So we'll, we'll look, look a little bit more at those um, more aerial footage as we go but thinking about this act of, of drawing and what is held in hand and whether it's the materials of drawing, the materials of painting, video, every time we're making visual art we're translating the world around us and within us into some kind of evidence uh, that's in front of us, some kind of mark. Uh, whether it's a stone held in hand or a seed looking at um, points of origin, looking at the, the geometries, looking at the structures, the color, the form, 
my practice for the last 15 years really has been about this act of close looking, close seeing, and moving between this active observation and imagination. So thinking about structures, thinking about relationships, and thinking about materials, touch, and, and translating those into, into forms, which may have an echo in, in the real world or, or not. And um, I, I'll, I'll refer often to the, the presence of the body um, in the, the work. And for me, that's something that is kind of multidimensional. It's my body as a drawing artist. It's about feeling, experiencing, remembering uh, the, the landscape that I'm in or the specimens that I'm dealing with translating that into Mark, letting the body carry the material, but it's also about the receiving body. It's about what a viewer feels when they encounter, encounter the work. And the hope is to kind of re reside in multiple states at the same time, kind of a, a past, present, and future of, of what, what might be in front of you. So um, there are two, two projects recently that um, have been very much about this, this approach to drawing, um, where I'm, I'm coming to specimens or environments with this dual eye of a scientist who's wanting to evaluate, document, and describe, um, but also as an artist translating color, form, structure, and feeling into marks and images, and really building on what's what's before me, running it through the lens of the senses, impressions of feeling, and my own my own drawing body. The result is drawings that can straddle art and science, the observed and the imagined, um, and hold traces of my own my own experience. And we're going to jump from the, the Badlands to basically to the North Pole. So uh, in 2018, I was invited by a, a research scientist working with the Norwegian Research Council on biodiversity and the arts um, to submit drawings to an exhibition. <laughs> and I put exhibition loosely in quotes. Um, one of the strangest exhibitions that I had ever heard of, um, which is to create artwork, which will then be buried um, in a mine shaft next to the Global Seed Vault on Svalbard Island near the North Pole. Um, and the seed vault is home to the most diverse collection of seeds in the world. A lot of people refer to it as the Doomsday Vault. It's the backup. It's where all the seeds of all the um, cultivatable um, plants are, are kept in, in deep storage and cold storage. And the idea behind the, the project was to invite artists from all over the world to create seed-based artworks that then speak to the cultural validity or the cultural life of seeds as well. So um, I, I basically went back to seventh grade science and I, I created a, a project where I was cultivating or germinating a wide variety of seeds, going through them and just looking at the forms and doing this close examination of seed anatomy, really tapping into the sense of how things start, how they begin, and taking very close, close observation um, of, of what was emerging. Finding these very bodily, finding these very organic, almost embryonic forms um, within, within each seed, doing a very quick anatomy lesson, filling in the blanks, uh, and wanting to speak to that anatomical structure um, and at the same time invent my own and speak to this notion of potential, um, how things grow, how things evolve, both on the page um, and, and in one's imagination. So this is very typical of how I work. And this is the studio that I'm sitting in right now. And actually thinking of the perspective from where this photo is taken, I'm standing right here. And this is what, what would be arrayed before me. So planting the crop, if you will, and making about 30 to 40 drawings, working into each one, sort of cultivating, um, separating the, the seed from the, the chaff, and then going in with multiple materials. And you can kind of get a sense over here of the, the things that may come into play. So I'm always working with combinations of ink, watercolor, wax, graphite, um, colored pencil, different, um, different forms of, of um, crayons. I have eyeshadow <laughs> at the ready. There's always something that can come into play. And from here, developing the set of seeds, each one with its own personality, each one echoing a different experience with the material, and still falling into this, this general sort of catalog of these, these forms. And 
then very quickly getting on a plane, going to Norway, going to Tromso, where they were exhibited for two hours, three hours um, at a public library. It was a, a large crowd of people. We talked about the, the, the importance of biodiversity, the importance of the cultural recognition of farming cultures, of um, what seeds are, what they do, what they can do. Got on another plane, went to Longyearbyen, which is very, it's, it is the farthest north you can go on the planet and still be in any kind of, of organized town. So short of a military installation or a research installation. Landing, being greeted by the local, local fauna, looking at what it looks like at midnight. We were just on the cusp of the midnight sun. It was more the, the midnight twilight. Getting to the vault and encountering the, the, the first of many alarming things that are occurring um, in the Arctic. And the seed vault is currently being retrofitted because it's flooding, because there is melting of the permafrost. So it's being fitted with new drainage systems and um, being made to handle the, the challenges of the, the changes ahead. So we proceeded to the closest, closest point of access next door, which is a, a mine which exists right alongside the, the seed vault. Uh, there were five artists. We put our, our work into boxes, put on our helmets, got a safety briefing, <laughs> looked very confident and headed into the mine with our art in these boxes. Uh, we're escorted into an, a portion of the mine shaft which holds the first seed vault uh, that was started by a university in Norway escorted in and deposited our work. <laughs> so here, here it lies um, next to a collection of seeds and um, instantly one is put in the mind of why would you do this? Why, <laughs> this is absurd on, on so many levels, but um, to have this sense of time and perspective and this, this gesture of human activity and we are alive for such a brief period as individuals, but our, our, our livelihood and our, our culture stretches beyond the individual. And just to have this one element of, of attention um, be put into a resting place. And whether it's discovered and opened in five years, 10 years, 20, 200, um, just knowing that there was that, that um, intention and that care and that way of thinking aesthetically about the, the science that's happening in the, the vault next door. And I did, I kept out one piece and there's something about the touch um, of a hand and something about what it means to, to put a mark on the page um, that made it, is sort of necessary for me to keep out one element um, that was still very fully, um, held was not a copy and um, could be could be kept back and thinking about the the importance of touch and thinking about the importance of of the material on the page um, transitions to the next and the the main project um, that we're looking at that are um, shown in the drawings that are up at the the gallery and um, moving between the badlands of New Mexico starting. So this is a Google image. Uh, this is a Google Earth shot of where we started uh, with the, the drone footage, obviously from a much higher altitude, and then a drawing that um, echoes some of those forms. About three years ago, four years ago now, um, my partner and I went to New Mexico and fell in love with the environment, with the light, everything you hear about the the, the land of enchantment and what the light does in New Mexico is not cliche. It is absolutely true. The light transforms um, everything it falls on, everything it reflects. And we built studios. Um, this is my little 10 by 12 foot studio that is perched on, um, I'll show you a map in a second. It's perched on this dividing line between the Badlands and the forest lands. So Northwest corner of New Mexico, uh, we have forest land here, badlands here, and to be able to walk 
into this environment and see just this richness of the raw elements, the materials, and know that this is an opportunity to use and to, to translate physically um, those elements into the materials of making and into the materials of drawing. So what I do, I go out, I, I poke around, I take bags, I harvest and bring the materials back into my studio. I grind, I suspend in um, various, various kinds of um, binders, creating the, the um, slurries that go down. And again, they're, they're mixed in with all these other materials that are in play, but it's, it's a way to, to connect them to the land. And thinking about this combination of the rawness of the environment, the, the sort of inaccessibility of the environment, and then this human vision of how the land is divided. Um, so this is just a, a little segment from very close to where we are. Our property is just kind of right, right down in here. And then the Badlands are all through here, looking at how this has been parceled out and looking at all of these boundaries that are invisible to the, the physical um, body as you're going through, but are very much a production of, of how culturally and economically we think about land um, and then turning those into drawings. So these are, these were not in the show, but these are all from harvested pigments and then thinking about those plat maps and thinking about those divisions um, that, we, that we create. These are a combination of earth pigment wax, water-soluble graphite, and ink. Each one is about 40, 40 by 26. And then the stones themselves, the stones under hand, the sense of scale, just huge, huge boulders to things that are held within your hand. And each one, upon closer examination, becomes a landscape, becomes a handheld landscape that you can travel into, find yourself lost within, and then thinking, obviously, zooming back and thinking about these other kinds of fractures and divisions, materials, conglomerates that are manifest in the, the landscape as a whole, and then translating those back, back into Mark. And at this point, too, it becomes so much more about imagination and memory than direct observation. So I have all the materials at hand. I've been walking. I've been collecting, just really sort of working as a filter uh, bringing all of these elements and ideas together, these textures. And as I'm drawing, as I'm working this way with these suspended pigments, starting to see these echoes of these geological processes that are manifest um, in, in the whole environment that I'm surrounded by while I'm working. There's this evidence of deposition and erosion, uh, materials being put down and taken away, being carved away by time or by my hand, uh, this, this feeling of, of these kind of momentous geological events happening in a very rapid scale on a very small scale in, in my hand and finding that to be disorienting in the best possible way. So not really having a sense of whether I'm looking at something that's, that's truly minute and held in my hand or on a much larger, larger scale geologically. So as a way to get even, even farther above um, the last time that I was out, which was summer of 2019, uh, I was working with a drone pilot named Kerry Brooks. And Kerry is fantastic. Um, his, his work speaks to his enthusiasm for the subject um, of both droning and the land. And he and I went out with a ranger from the Bureau of Land Management to a number of these Badlands sites uh, that I'd been looking at on Google Earth and fantasizing about and salivating over and trying to figure out if um, special access was needed. And special access was indeed needed. <laughs> Permits were purchased and we went out with a ranger and it was fantastic to hear what her interpretation was of how resource development is, is proceeding and um, this notion of touched versus untouched land. And that's a whole other conversation of how the BLM has, has approached um, drilling and mining and all these other development interests and wanting to be quote, as, as tender as they can to the lands that they're, they're developing. And at the same time, you know, it's leasing, uh, leasing these public lands to a whole variety of energy interests. So part of what I was interested in is this balance between the touched and the untouched. And 
um, the space where we first droned um, has some recognition in uh, Georgia O'Keeffe's work. And I didn't realize that until I was looking into it more, more deeply called the Black Place. And um, some of these may, may look familiar, but to go from, as we went into the Black Place, and I'll, I'll cue up the next video, um, as we went through and being in this very administrative mindset as we started, you know, and checking all these things off the list and the, the ranger going through with her, her laptop telling us where we could and couldn't go and where the, the tribal lands started and where private lands began and where industrial interests, you know, various pipelines being carved through and cut through, all of that kind of dropped away um, once we got there. And there was this sense of just the, the, the isolation, the desolation, the dryness, um, the just this landscape that so deeply underscores that we are on a planet <laughs> that is, you know, just so diverse in what it can offer up in terms of experience, in terms of landscape, in terms of just sheer bounty and beauty. Um, it, again, it's hard to not get into the, the land of cliche when talking about how fruitful um, and how awe-inspiring and humbling it is to be physically within this, this space um, and just confronting 60 million years of time laid bare. And um, the landscape that we're looking at in particular here the, um, in the San Juan Basin, the top layer of soil is this very crunchy, delicate, um, cryptobiotic soil, this clay that collapses underfoot. So as you walk over it, it, it physically disintegrates and your, your footsteps are there. So fortunately, there are these game trails that go through where you can walk and you can um, sort of follow within the, the deer path that might be there. But this is where I would, I would go and collect pigment. And then this challenge, of, you can see, I'm going to pause it here, actually. You can see just this, this foot trail that goes through and it's this this shaking of of perspective um, because this is this is not all that high off the ground these are not that large um, but they really give you this sense of um again just this dis disorientation about being in this this space so what do you do with all this um it's being in this this space having this confrontation with this richness the materiality um, of the, the soil underfoot, um, and for me wanting to translate, and you can see here's a, here's a pipeline land, or here's a pipeline track that's just right above it, a road that's next to that, very much in, in close, close company. So gathering, gathering some pigments here, and then coming back to the studio. And really, this is this is that point of synthesis, and this is the work that's in the show um, that is currently currently up at the CMA. Are these points of synthesis of taking the material, remembering what it was like to feel that kind of smallness, uh, that kind of humility, delicacy, precariousness, precarity—a word that is very popular these days—but um, and and letting that come into the images that are both based on, but in evolving from both the landscape held in hand, the sense of what it is to be above and the sense of what it is to be within. And again, just, I think it's just this sense of, of bounty and excitement, uh, looking at a landscape like this, seeing the color, seeing the texture taking it back. And here's, here's what happens in a 10 by 12 foot <laughs> little, little, little shed. This was a tough shed, which is serving double duty as the, the studio um, on the, on the hillside, translating into marks. And I, I, I put these in here as, as what, what would have been um, so this next, um, just a couple of slides, these are hoodoos, which are these amazing stone formations, which are embedded within these, these Badlands um, environments. And so thinking about close looking, thinking about going into the structure, 
of these and just spending more time with these and thinking of them as these monuments to, to deep time and fairly swift erosion um, and appreciating that, that flux in perspective that kicks in as we, we look at things that are just, you know, millennia um, in the making. And then coming back to the studio and, and appreciating the time that goes into making the image on the page. And I have to, I jump straight to website information, but <laughs> so that is where, and it's again, interesting. I am, I am sitting in the spot. Um, if, if I were to switch my down camera to what I see in, in front of me, that's what, that's what is here right now. So, um, this, this confluence of material, of experimentation, of play, um, and just this hope to try to, to tap into some of the, the raw elemental excitement uh, that I encounter every time I go out, every time I pick up a stone, every time I pick up a seed, and just being able to see what's there. So I will, I will come to a pause, come to a pause there and And yes, hi. <laughs> so I can I can leave it on a I'll leave it there. I don't know. So we can or, you know, Jackie, do you have a is there a landscape yeah. that you'd like to see? I can <laughs> leave yeah, it. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. That was that was beautiful. You know, the more the more you show, the more you start to feel yourself relax and become immersed and you just start losing yourself in just the imagery alone. I can only imagine when you're actually you know, on site and in a location, you know, how intense that can be for you. Yeah. And what's funny too, I mean, I think the, the, the format of the talk itself mirrors that in some ways, because it's this approach that's kind of, it, it, I, I come in feeling clinical, I think. And as I continue talking, like that sort of, it tends to drop away and this mm -hmm. connection emerges where there's just more, more fluidity, I think, and more, um, I don't know, just more, more, more playfulness and more um, sort of presence kicks, kicks in as well. And there's an instinct, I think, that, that flows in the drawings too, which um, is part of what, what makes them exciting to see, you know, it's just like, where does, where does instinct take you when you're, when you're drawing? And you feel, you feel a, you feel a shift. I love what you said about the close looking practice, because you can, you, the more immersed you get into it, the more your eyes really start to take over. Yeah. And, um, you know, on an intuitive level, you're starting to see things and recognize things that you wouldn't have done before because you're suspending this um, state of logic in a way. I mean, you're, yes. you're seeing things, but you're suspending something yeah. in order to go a little bit deeper and see a little bit more. Yeah. Is that similar to when you're working with your own images, is that similar in your own process that you? Yeah, no, completely. And I think that's the, that's the pathway to something that feels satisfying and true uh, versus trying to make something that is a rendition of an image or a copy of something or even a, a diagram. And I think there's, there's a part of me too that kicks in. When you, you speak to this, you know, the logic dropping away, it's where my I, this becomes a little weird. I know this is being recorded, but you know, I, I, I shrink, you know, if you think about the movie, the, the fantastic voyage, you know, where people are injected into the, the bloodstream, that's the moment when it feels so exciting. And I've got a, a 20 by 40 inch or a you know, 40 by 60 inch piece of um, synthetic paper. And we can, we can talk about surfaces, but you know, working on the UPO paper, which, which holds all these materials just on the surface. So everything is floating, everything is colliding, it's moving, it's in action. And I do kind of feel like I'm inside it. I feel like I can maneuver, I can manipulate, and I can be carried along. You know? And I think it's more in that being carried along sensation where I feel like the, the pathways get, get made, the connections happen. Um, and it's delightful. Like it really, it's, it's this source of endless pleasure for me. Like I love going to the places that are, that are happening on the page and it's not about, okay, can I capture where I was? It's more, can I create someplace new to go? Or can I make a map to a place that I would love to find myself? Um, and then maybe a map that I can offer to others if they, if they want to come as well. But, um, that's, 
that's what drawing does for me. It's just, it's, it's bodily, it's immediate, it's confrontational in some ways. Like it's kind of the struggle on the page and I love that struggle. It feels, it feels nourishing. We had a question come up, Sarah, um, on our comment feed and I invite everybody to leave a comment or post a question that we can ask Sarah. And it had me thinking a little bit about when you talk about moving on the surface in your paper and your materials. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it makes me think about the viscosity of the pigments that you're working with. And um, we had a question about being able to talk more about how you're making your pigments um, mm -hmm. from some of those natural materials. And Happily, I think, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I can go back to some of the, the grinding. And it's funny, I mean, there, there are books written on these and I, I was buying the books and I realized very quickly that the books basically reduced to like three paragraphs. <laughs> so, you collect the pigment, you grind the pigment, you filter the pigment, you suspend the pigment. And um, so in the process of collecting and, and obviously the, the softer, the easier, um, and in these Badlands, and I should say too, the BLM Ranger, she was wonderful because she was with us for this, this major outing when we were going out with a drone. And I was like, is it okay if I, <laughs> do you mind if I, if I collect? And she's like, of course, of course you can, you know, but there was this, this hesitation, you know, and it was just so funny too, to feel that individual sort of recalcitrance in the midst of like this huge mining operation, you know, like being surrounded by all of these apparatuses of, of deep extraction, you know, and, and me questioning, like, is it okay if I take this rock? You know, but, <laughs> that <laughs> so, idea of scale, you know, exactly. it's, it's that sense yeah. of scale. Yeah. 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 And that sense of impact too. Like what happens if I remove this rock? Like, am I disturbing this ecosystem? You know, like, will it, will it be replaced? You know, or it can't be replaced. What do I, what, what responsibility do I bear, you know, for, for altering the environment in this way? But that aside, taking the pigments, going back to the studio, using, this is a, a granite um, uh, pest mortar and pestle. So grinding things up into a powder, suspending the powder in, a, in jars, um, in water, letting the heavier particles, so after everything's been ground out, letting the heavier particles settle to the bottom, and then pouring off in progress. So essentially it's this titration process. And so pouring off that, that upper layer where the, the lighter things are suspended and we all know about droplets and aerosols. And so essentially it's like letting the heavier stuff settle, letting the, the light things float for a while. And then this progressive pouring off until it's this really fine, fine powder um, that is, uh, Obviously, it's a range of range of colors, and then um, that can be mixed into any number of um, suspensions. So, um, I've got a couple. I think for this one, I was using a, a glycerin and honey combination for a, a watercolor pigment. Um, but I mean, we've been doing this for tens of thousands of years. You can mix it with spit. You can mix. It, <laughs> you can basically mix pigment with with anything that um, has a little traction to it. Um, so different kinds of glues, different kinds of um, other binders, and then and then using those on um, on this synthetic paper too, where you also have this. As I'm working on them, there's this immediate sense of the deposition that's happening. Like there's there's still this granular aspect. I'm going to jump ahead to a couple where the... and I'm, I'm just going to mention Sarah really yeah. quickly as I you know as my eyes are becoming more and more into the work mm -hmm. I just have to compliment you on just the beautiful edge work I mean we talk about mark making mm. and you've got beautiful mark making but just getting into those the nuances of your edges and we that mm. might be another well we can circle back around to that but it's something that I'm just now noticing the beauty of how you treat the edge. Mm. Things, and it's, you know? it's, in, I mean, like the edge is, the edge is important. The edge, <laughs> the edge is vital. <laughs> and it's interesting too seeing these that are up. And I think all of these actually are hanging with maybe one exception, maybe two. Um, I think all of these are, are in the, the gallery right now and, mm -hmm. you know, really containing that form on the page, you know, so it's, it, it has a boundary it has a line and um, whether it's intentional, whether it's a way of making them into, into figures of a sort, you know, or, or accentuating the fact that this is this parcel of, of space. Um, 
I, I almost never take things off the edge of a page. Like I always stop a little short because I think I want to know just the, the extent of what's in front of me. And it's, it's always fascinating and transformative to, to take that edge off, you know, to, to crop in such a way where it comes in and there's a different kind of expansiveness. Mm. And I don't know, I think, again, we, we all have our own psychology. I like to see, I like to see an edge. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, this is, this is what's in front of me right now. This is what, what's, what's in play. I think it helps really kind of underscore the, the, the beauty and the simplicity that's there, but also the complexity. There's this nice balance that it creates. And, um, and, and also I think it helps with, with, with really great breathing room in the piece. You know, there's something in these pieces that you can take a lot in, but then you want to breathe it out. You know, there's this hmm. sort of um, breath around it. That's very nice. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. I had a question come in um, from our viewers and one person has asked, uh, Sarah, how has not being able to be in New Mexico due to the pandemic affected your connection to the inspiration of the landscape? So it, it has trans, well, I think so many practices and so many things have been transformed um, in the last few months and the unexpected turn, get another, another image up, but a different turn that was taken was I, I started I'm not even sure how to jump to this, but I, I began teaching geological drawing workshops online um, to people far and wide. And it became all about the handheld landscape. So I, within an arm's reach right now, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten 10 rocks, slabs. I mean, just it's surrounding myself with these rich specimens. Um, and I want to make a shout out to Joan at Beckham's Barn in Irmo, who is just one of the most amazing geological connectors um, in the region. So she has been fantastic at supplying stones uh, for these, these workshops. And they've been so much about appreciating all the detail um, that you can find in a, you know, a three by five inch space. Um, and still doing all those same things, translating the look, the feel, the sensation, um, the associations that you make, um, the color, the unpredictability of a line, translating that onto the page through drawing. So I think really the main thing that's shifted is my scale has become, you know, that it's, it's here. <laughs> it's a, does this feel constricting? Sometimes, but not really. I mean, it's, there's, there's, I think in some ways there's just as much activity and there's just as much time. It's just in a much smaller fragment. And I could, I, if, if given the challenge, this is the only thing you can draw for the rest of your life, it could be done. <laughs> there, there's, there's potential here, but that's been the main, the main, the main shift is, is scale and format and, you know, of course, excited to go back and keen to be in that space again. I, you know, that the, the notion of scale has come up for me uh, over and over. And some of the slides that you showed were, were giant pieces. And this ability to kind of go from very, very fine, small objects to very large landscapes. And can you talk a little bit more about that in your practice in terms of uh, the intention of, of how to bring the viewer into that moment. Um, you know, it, it's just interesting how scale is massive and then also very minuscule. And I'm curious yeah. to hear a little bit more. No, I think, thanks. And I think there's, um, in, in these pieces in particular, hopefully there's a balance between the, the larger form and then its constituent parts. And so looking at the, you know, the overall assembly of how how parts fit together and then hopefully driven by curiosity or, or a sense of you know just willingness to to look um we'll see that each each part then you can kind of zero in on another part and you can zero in on another part and there's this successive layering of detail and there's a successive layering of, of kinds of experiences that you can have with the materials and with the marks and this is part of what i love about working with pigments and suspension is you get this granulation that happens that is so similar to these geological processes that, that are ongoing, you know? And so I think for, for the curious viewer, 
there there are definitely layers and levels um, that you can you can experience and those mirror the same layers and levels that I go through in the process of looking at a stone or a seed or a leaf. I've also been doing lots of botanical drawing workshops online where, you know, it's just, it's the close study of the vein structure of a leaf and just finding this sense of pleasure and discovery and, and again, drawing being so uniquely suited to this simultaneous movement between your hand and your eye. You know, so it's this act of intake as you're looking, as you're seeing, as you're experiencing something. And then within that same moment, being able to convey that experience, being able to, to participate with your, with your whole body in that experience of seeing. You know, so it's, it's this idea that drawing is the whole body mm -hmm. engaged in this act of, of intake and um, like active, active curiosity, you know, and, and embodying that sense of breathing in the information and then exhaling it in the form of a mark. Have you have you ever fought the urge to um, become a botanist in your <laughs> in your spare time? <laughs> I have so no, but I've totally like I've perfected the I am not a botanist. I am not a geologist. <laughs> a list of things I am not, you know. So, um, but my it's I think just to see these these parallels in processes um, is it's validating. It's exciting. It's kind of, I mean, it's, it's one of those kind of cheap thrills too, where you realize that what you're doing on this very small scale is, is this echo of this planetary process. Um, and it's, it's a way to feel connected. It's a way to feel awake. Um, and I think it's, it's a way to feel a particular kind of productive, creative joy too, like to, to be able to put something on the page and, and not know what it's going to be you know, and to not have this set expectation for what it is, but rather to have a conversation with it and just let it evolve and let it become something and know that you were, you were a part of that process. Like you weren't the whole thing, you know, it's like, but the, it was a conversation between you and material and time and gravity and mm. humidity. <laughs> Things drive faster in New Mexico <laughs> than they do in South Carolina. They do. <laughs> I know you've got sort of this uh, interesting contrast in humidity levels and uh, pressure. Interesting's a good word. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I've been to New Mexico on a, on a number of occasions, and just the difference in everything is, yeah. is you know, is, is ex sometimes very extreme from the South to the West. Indeed. And um, how have you? I'm just curious if you have any favorite places in. South Carolina that you've been to landscape wise that um, you have you have enjoyed or been very attracted to? I mean, it's interesting. Like my first thought when I react to that is, and this in a way circles back to your your first question about how have how have things changed during during the last you know eight months, nine months? I have gotten to know the geology of my neighborhood so well. And this is a funny thing to say, but there was a, um, there's a creek that's not far, you know, it's, it's like a block and I've sort of, I've known the creek, the creek flows through, I walk around it, I walk by it. This summer was the first time that I, you know, I went down into it, you know, and, and seeing the, the, the waterfalls that were happening, seeing the, the geological structures that were, were changing over the course of the creek bed. Um, I, I, I went to check on it today, you know, just to see how the creek was doing after the rain. And so I think um, the, the, uh, the geology, the landscape of the Southeast, any landscape, it doesn't, I grew up in Iowa, you know, and just when you think of Iowa, you think of flat, you think of, you think of seeds, you think of things growing, you know, and just knowing that there is just this endless bounty and diversity in any environment that we find ourselves in, no matter how, how barren quote barren, how quote desolate, overgrown, um, redundant. I think just as long as there is a rock to pick up, as there's a leaf to look at, um, there's there's endless things to discover. I think that's that's uh, kind of leads into a question that I was that was on my mind in terms of you know what what can people do in their own daily practice that they can take away from the work that you do um, that they can become you know, 
better absorbed not only in their environment and nature, but also a better steward of it as well, because you talk about the impact um, that you've seen going to different places. Um, and, and, you know, every, I think that your art is so inspiring that folks feel as though, what can I do, you know? And uh, I'm curious to know a little bit more of your thoughts around that as well. Yeah, yeah my, my first thought with that, I think, is just to have, to cultivate the appreciation and to, to know that we don't have to be everywhere. You know, it's like the, the human animal does not have to occupy the entire planet. <laughs> it's, 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 it's okay that there are places that are, that are untouched. And to, I think to, to value the impact that we have and to think about it, you know, on, on both sides, you know, so the positive impact that we have, the destructive impact that we have, and just to, to take responsibility for that in, in your personal life and just thinking about what, um, what a day means to you. What have you done in a day? What have you done in a year? Um, and from an aesthetic perspective or, or from this sort of a pathway, I think, into a kind of engagement, um, this maybe is a parallel answer to, to what can you do and how do you cultivate that awareness is to take something that you take for granted, whether it's a, a stone, a seed, a rock, you know, a, a leaf, and really look at it and really be with it and just feel that connection between its structure and your own structure. Um, you know, looking just at the, the venous structure of a leaf, like it's, it's impossible to not think of your own circulatory system. You know, I mean, it just, as, as you're looking at a, 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 an intricate stone, it's impossible, I think, to not think about the environment that's around you, you know, and to think about the processes. So I think just we all owe ourselves moments of awareness and, and moments of attention and slowness and, and care. And whether, whether you make a drawing from it or not doesn't matter. And whether or not you think that drawing is good or not also doesn't matter. The drawing is an amazing way to slow the senses and corral the senses and um, just give your, give your body an opportunity to commune with something that's outside of you. I love it, love it. You know, I started thinking um, as I was going through the slides and some of the really amazing places that you've been to, I was curious about what's your dream site? What would be, if you could go and conquer any other place, oh. what would they, what, where, where would they be and what would it be? I'm kind of in it right now. Oh, that's <laughs> it's, awesome. that's it's, I mean, it's, it's at a distance right now, but like it's, and it's interesting. We were talking about, um, we were talking about snorkeling before, before we went on. And <laughs> um, I think just that the, the space in New Mexico right now that is, that we've been lucky enough to land in and find ourselves moving through is just, it's mysterious and strange and unknown and challenging and hard. And so I think, and beautiful. And so I think any place that has all of those things coming together, and I think about snorkeling, we were, we were chatting before, and it's that, that intersection of mystery and delight and a, a little bit of danger you know it's just this sense of like I'm not sure if I'm meant to be here <laughs> like if, if my body is 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 adapted to this so maybe discomfort you know is, is another way to, to think about it but I think a kind of discomfort is a really good way also to cultivate awareness you know and so something that that wakes you up is that's that's a good place to be um, so I, fe I feel very awake when I'm there and there, there are many other places as well, but that's, that's the first one that comes to mind. <laughs> so. oh, that's wonderful. And it, it, and, and I would definitely agree being in New Mexico, Northern New Mexico is just a fabulous place. And you showed some from the black place and I think it was white place or white sands, New Mexico, I'm trying mm. to, the, um, but the George O'Keefe country that, yeah. Yeah. that um, is just spectacular, spectacular. And you, showed some of those images. They were just yeah. wonderful. Sarah, thank you so, so much for thank just you. sharing all these wonderful adventures with us. I think in this time, in this day and age, um, during a pandemic, I think so many of us are craving those moments of exploration and adventure. 
And, um, you know, we have to be sort of limited in that right now. So I think that your art and the arts are a, a really wonderful way that can offer us some escape and some connection to those landscapes and places mm -hmm. that one day we hope to become and get back to. So. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm also an optimist at heart. So yes. <laughs> I'm a realist and an optimist. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. And, you know, we look forward to hearing about more of your adventures and seeing, you know, when we get on the other side of this, sort of where you might land and, and what new landscapes you might encounter. So following your work is going to be um, really wonderful for many of our viewers. So thank you so much for allowing the museum to show it. And um, and yeah, I, you know, we've had some wonderful comments coming in off of the Facebook feed. And um, just again, wanna thank you so, so much, Sarah. Um, I wanna let everybody know that uh, Sarah's show, um, Island Nations Lands Divided, will be up in the Ginyard Gallery through January 10th. Uh, this week, we also have free first Thursdays on Main. So this Thursday, you can come on by and see the whole museum for free. But the Ginyard Gallery is open all the time and it's free access for all. So don't wait for first Thursday, but you definitely have this week to check it out. I also want to um, promote Sarah's website. Um, Sarah's got a beautiful website and she offers uh, classes where she teaches um, her techniques. And I love the close looking and the close practice looking, but she offers all this through her website. So please check it out. It's at Sarah schneckloth.com i'm going through a breakneck a breakneck yeah, absolutely. section of slides getting there if you're <laughs> absolutely sarah schneckloth.com and um oh okay can't yes. yeah so this is this was the thing that didn't happen this year it was um meant to be the inaugural inaugural year of taking of of working with artists in these environments so um there there were there, there are three people who are already registered for next semester or next semester next <laughs> next summer also predicated on the optimistic um, but it's it's this desire to to share in this environment as well so um, it's this four day immersive in the space um, workshop but anyway it's there's there's tons more information information about it on the the site itself but it's this hope to be able to, to make this experience available for, for more people. Mm. I've heard so many wonderful things about, about taking your classes and workshops. Mm. So um, yeah, I would definitely encourage anyone and everyone to check them out. Um, Sarah does a fantastic job and we're so thrilled to have her in the Ginn Yard. And if, if, if you enjoyed today's talk, we've got more of these great virtual programs coming up. Um, you can check out the Columbia Museum of Arts website um, where you'll find a listing of various different programs like these coming up. And uh, you can also look at our Museum From Home webpage where we put previously recorded um, episodes and programs um, right there for you to enjoy whenever you would like. And um, no time like the present to become a member of the museum. So art is a big part of our lives right now. Um, and um, if you enjoyed this program and many more to come, please consider becoming a member of the CMA. And with that, I wanna thank you all for being here today. That's gonna to conclude our talk. And Sarah, thank you again. And Jackie, uh, thank you. All, yes, and we thank hope you for all... the opportunity and thanks to the museum, everyone. I really appreciate what everything that's transpired over the last three, four months. It's been wonderful. Absolutely. And we hope you all have enjoyed today's talk and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the museum and thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day.